I'm so pleased to welcome Tevi Troy to discuss his new book, What Jefferson Read, Ike Watched, and Obama Tweeted. Troy writes that presidents help shape our culture, are shaped by our culture, and are now one of the few parts of the culture that we all share. The book takes a fresh look at what we can learn about our presidents from their cultural activities, from the Founding Fathers' extensive libraries, all the way to Obama's discussion of The Wire. Mr. Troy is currently a senior fellow at Hudson Institute and has previously served as a White House aide in the George W. Bush administration. Please join me in welcoming Tevi Troy. Thank you, Abby. Thanks for all of you for coming, and, and thanks to Politics and Prose. I was telling Abby as I walked in that my first Politics and Prose was over 20 years ago. I came to an event where Sidney Blumenthal was speaking about his book, and I happened to have read the book. And afterwards, I went up and met him, and I told him what I th thought about the book, you know, some of the things I liked and some of the things I didn't like. And he didn't like that very much. But uh, <laughs> I, I'm more open to uh, whatever your thoughts may be on the book. But first, let me tell you a little bit about it. The book is, as Abby said, what Jefferson read, Ike watched, and Obama tweeted. 200 Years of Pop Culture in the White House. And I started kind of thinking about the idea for this book a couple of years ago when President Obama was speaking at the White House Correspondents' Dinner. This was during the fight over the health care bill. Oh, yeah, we're still having that fight. But uh, this was around the initial fight over the health care bill. And President Obama was talking about how he was going to be able to get the law through Congress, and particularly the provision known as the tanning tax. And he said that in order to get the tanning tax through, we're going to have to have a special exemption for John Boehner and Snooki. And I was kind of flabbergasted that the president of the United States mentioned Snooki. And I mean, it was a White House Correspondents' Dinner, so people there got the joke. But I'm not sure that it's a joke that played in middle America then or now. But I was really surprised that, that President Obama made that reference because I don't know how many of you know much about Snooki, but she's kind of... Loudmouth, foul uh, her she's a reality star from Jersey Shore, and her philosophy in life is uh, what's known as GTL, Jim Tan Laundry. I don't know uh, ex exactly what that means, and I don't even know what that means from watching the show because I've never watched the show, but I, I, once I started looking into this, I, I found this out about her, and it just didn't seem like the role model that a, a president would mention. At the same time, the president has this goal of trying to reach out to people, the White House correspondent, you're trying to be funny. And so there, there's, there's a countervailing tension there. But then later it got more interesting because President Obama went on The View. Uh, he's been on The View a bunch of times, about half a, a dozen times uh, during the presidency. And one of the women on The View asked him what he thought of Snooki. And he said something very interesting. He said, well, to be honest, I don't really know who Snooki is. But he also joked about her in a very public forum. And so it, it led to this question that formulated in my head. Are we better off with the president of the United States who knows who Snooki is or who doesn't know who Snooki is? And that is kind of the tension that I try and capture in the book. What's better for the republic, for the presidency, for, for governing? And I, the Snooki thing so struck me that I actually came up with the book title from that. Now, of course, it's not the title you see before you because the, the title changed. But the title I came up with initially was From Cicero to Snooki, How Culture Shapes Our Presidents. Because our founders, as I'm going to talk about in a, in a few minutes, uh, were very invested in the Roman classicists the, and the um, people like Cicero and um, and Cato, and, and they read that very carefully. And so I was thinking of the, this contrast between what John Adams read and what President Obama talked about. Now, I, w I found a publisher. They liked the idea for the book. They didn't like the title. And I asked why, and they said, because the Venn diagram of people who know Snooki and know Cicero never intersects. <laughs> and I think they're right about that. And so I, I did go along with them, and we, we changed the title. But they were right for another reason. Because three years ago, when Snooki was having her moment, as it were, she was somewhat well known in some circles. But now, three years later, she is uh, she has unlamentably, if you ask me, passed from the scene and no longer is sharing this kind of moment. No longer is that culturally relevant a figure. Cicero, in contrast, I would say, is as relevant as he was three years ago and will be a hundred years from now. So, I decided to write the book with a different title, but still try and capture this tension. And in doing so, I went all the way back to the Founding Fathers, went back to the earliest days of our republic to see what they took in culturally. And I say took in culturally because part of this book is a technological exploration. 
a look at what the technologies, what platforms were available for providing content to people. So our founding fathers, if you go back in time, they had two options if you were interested in either education or entertainment. And those two options were live entertainment or the written word. Now, obviously, those two options remain with us today, but we have so many more options. We have a panoply of options, so many choices before us. And one of the questions I ask in the book is, we, there are many more choices available, but are our presidents making better selections? So in looking at this book, I went back to the Founding Fathers. I looked at those two options that they had of reading and of live entertainment, and I looked at what what they read, what inspired them, what, the, what they focused on. And, and one of the things I found out, the first thing I, I really dug into, was how difficult it was to obtain books back then. And I have the statistic in the book that a first edition of Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations in 1776 in the colonies cost the equivalent of 615 of today's dollars. And if you think about it, that's about the cost of an iPad today. And an iPad can store something like 160,000 to 180,000 books, depending on the size. So our founding fathers would be spending a lot of money, an iPad's worth of money, just to get a single book. Thomas Jefferson, who famously said, I cannot live without books, had a library of 6,000 books. Now, not all of them cost the, that $615, but they were all expensive. And he recognized the financial hit that he took from buying all these books. He wasn't the only one. Uh, Adams also, John Adams, bought a lot of books and complained about bankrupting himself through books. Um, and he had a multi-thousand book library, I think it was in the, in the 3,000 range. And, and just to give you some perspective on how valuable books were in those days, there is a college in Massachusetts that is named after a man who donated his 400 book library to that college. The man's name was John Harvard. And Harvard College still bears his name because he donated 400 books over 400 years ago. So books were very pricey. But nevertheless, our founding fathers really invested themselves in books. They immersed themselves in books. They took books seriously. They discussed books and the ideas that were in those books over the dinner table. And the books they read helped lead to the revolution and breaking away from England was indeed a revolutionary act. It's something that had never been done before. And the ideas that they found in books, whether it was in the, the European Enlightenment or it was in the Roman classics, helped inspire them, but also to formulate some of their thoughts about how to express their ideas. And you could see very clearly, for example, in the Declaration, there are the ideas of Locke, uh, of John Locke in, in Jefferson's writing in, in the Declaration. And this not only was an intellectual exercise, but it was also a motivational exercise because I found that George Washington in that difficult winter at Valley Forge, in order to motivate the troops, he showed them Addison's Cato, a play about Cato and his struggles against the development of tyranny and empire in, in, the, in the old Roman Republic. And so he used that to inspire the, the troops. Another inspirational work at the time was Common Sense by Thomas Paine. Now, Thomas Paine's Common Sense was a mega bestseller in those days. In fact, if you adjust for population size, it sold at about equivalent levels to books in our era like Peyton Place uh, or Dune. So these were, these were mega bestsellers in our time, but in those times, people were, were spending their money to buy a work of political philosophy and a book that inspired the people to continue fighting the revolution against England. And so the founders not only immersed themselves in books, not only motivated themselves by books, but they took books seriously enough to engage in the idea of how we develop our government through books. And I tell the story in the book of James Madison, who was thinking about a form of government when the Articles of Confederation were not working and they were coming up to start planning the Constitutional Convention. And he asked Thomas Jefferson for some advice on some books to read about the proper structure of government. And again, remember how books ex were expensive or how expensive books were in those days. Jefferson sent Madison two cratefuls of books on law, on history, on philosophy, from the classics and from the Enlightenment. And Madison devoured those books. He read all of them, and he wrote himself a long memo based on those books. And that memo was the basis of his thinking in the Constitutional Convention, 
the writing of the Constitution and then later in the writings of the Federalist Papers. So books were extremely important, and I write in the book that our founders had this notion, they had this belief that what they were trying to create was an enlightened leadership that ruled over an educated populace. And what I found as we went forward in time in the writing of the book is that that notion of the enlightened leadership and the educated populace was challenged by a couple of external forces, forces that the founders had not anticipated. And the first force that I found, and it's something I talk about in the second era, I really talk about five technological errors in the book, or, or five eras of types of, of cultural ingestion. The second era was the era of small d democracy, because democracy in the 19th century was kind of raucous and unruly, and in a way that was unanticipated by the founders, because they had this, this notion of these enlightened rulers from on high, and that was not necessarily what developed in the 19th century. And in this 19th century period, we talked about theater and how important the theater was as a form of political communication. Because today, if President Obama wants to reach out to us, he has many options for doing that. He can go on his Twitter feed, he can go on YouTube, he can go on TV. Any president has, has these options before them. These are relatively new developments, but they were important uh, they were not available at the time. Well, in those days, if a president wanted to go and see and be seen, they went to live entertainment. They would travel on what were known as goodwill tours. They would go around the country, and they would go to theatrical pro productions. And at those theatrical productions, they would see the people. They would wave to the people. People would cheer them, and they would also see what was the what was going on at the time. And so I tell the story of James Monroe, who went around the country uh, after his election uh, in, in 1817, like the 1816 election, but after, in 1817, once he was president, he went around the country and he went on this goodwill tour and he went to South Carolina, which was at the time uh, the, the theatrical capital of the South, and he went to Charleston and saw the available productions there. And I also tell the story of the 1824 election, which was a hotly contested election between John Quincy Adams, who was clearly this model of enlightened leadership that the founders had sought. He was, I argue, the best prepared person ever to be president in terms of his educational level and his knowledge of multiple languages and his ability to translate Latin and Greek, which was a, a hobby of his, and his previous jobs as ambassador to, to multiple countries and as secretary of state. So John Quincy Adams was incredibly prepared to be president, incredibly well-educated, but he wasn't necessarily prepared for the Democratic era. Now, he won that 1824 election, but he did not win the popular vote, nor did he win the electoral vote. Andrew Jackson won both of those, but he won a plurality of both, not a majority. And so this election, hotly contested, went to the House of Representatives, and Henry Clay threw his support behind Quincy Adams, and Quincy Adams became president, and Clay became Secretary of State, and this was known as the corrupt bargain. And the people were irate. They were, first of all, Jackson was more popular, but second of all, this seemed unseemly, improper, inappropriate. And so Quincy Adams goes to the theater in Washington, and he was a fan of the theater, and he went, went not long after his, uh, th this election and, and the corrupt bargain emerged. And theater, I argue in the book, is a two-way medium. You react to your audience, and it's not like film, which is static. Once the film is on the screen, it will never change. But theatrical productions can change based on who is play playing them, who is in the audience, how the audience is reacting. And so in this particular play, the actors noticed that John Quincy Adams was in the house. I and mean, they couldn't help but notice. He was, he, was, uh, <laughs> he was kind of an important person. And they ad-libbed references to General Jackson. And in doing so, the crowd cheered lustily at every one of these references to Jackson, which kind of irked John Quincy Adams, who, as I said, was a theater fan, but became less so, less of one, did not go to the theater nearly as often after that incident. And so what we had was the development of a period in which perhaps you, it was best to be a John Quincy Adams to govern, but you had to be an Andrew Jackson in order to get elected. And I tell the story of Andrew Jackson being offered a, and, and getting a, a honorary degree from Harvard, something that infuriated John Quincy Adams, who thought that Jackson was some kind of barbarian who couldn't even spell, and he wasn't wrong about the spelling. And 
Jackson goes up to Harvard despite Quincy Adams' obj objections. And Quincy Adams had an opportunity to object because his cousin was president of Harvard at the time. But his, his uh, cousin didn't listen. Jackson gets the, the degree. And at the time, the language that they spoke at Harvard was Latin. And when they try to speak in Latin to Jackson and ask him to answer, he says, the only Latin I know is E pluribus unum which is clearly a very populist attempt not only to show that he doesn't speak Latin, that he is one of the people, but also that he understands the American idea. And so Jackson was very skillful at, at capturing the, this, at understanding this democratic nature of the, the 19th century. And one of the other people I talk about in the, in the book in this period, who I think really understood this, uh, the, the need to appeal to the people was Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln rose himself up by virtue of his intellect and his reading. He grew up in a relatively obscure area in, a poor, in poverty and in a rural place where there was not a lot of access to books. Nevertheless, he would walk many miles, as we all know, to find the, the latest available book. If he couldn't find a book, he reread the books that he had before him. And some of the books that he read and reread and reread included the Bible and Shakespeare and Aesop's fables. And we see in his later rhetoric his knowledge and understanding of those works, that he knew how to tell a story, for example, from Aesop's fables, and he used his stories to tell points, as we all saw in the movie Lincoln not that long ago. But he was not an intellectual snob in that he would not reference the books he read. He focused on being a man of the people, and I told the story about Jackson in Latin at one point when Lincoln was a trial lawyer before he was president, he was at, at a court case, and someone says something in Latin, and Lincoln, not unlike the Jackson comment, says, if that's Latin, sir, you'd better get yourself another witness. Lincoln was not going to be one of these too hot to trot, too fancy for the masses people. He understood the common male and, and their appeal. And so that was the first challenge to the, the, the founder's notion of enlightened leadership, the, the rise of this democratic ethos. But in the 20th century, the second challenge arose, the second external challenge, and that was technology. And technology developed in such a way that it gave presidents opportunities to project themselves to much larger audiences than were just available for them. Andrew Jackson, who I said had kind of mastered the, the populist approach, spoke to 10,000 people at his inauguration, which is pretty darn good if you think about it without a microphone. I mean, I'm speaking to 45 people here with, with a microphone. When Warren G. Harding, nowhere near the politician that Andrew Jackson was, spoke on the radio, the first presidential address over the radio for someone who was as president, Woodrow Wilson had given a speech on the radio after he was president, but so the first presidential speech on the radio by Warren G. Harding, he spoke to 125,000 people. And so the opportunity for presidents to reach much greater audiences expanded by virtue of technology, specifically the uh, radio, but also the, the development of film. And I talk about Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who mastered this medium of radio. And people right now are thinking, oh, yes, of course, the fireside chats. But I'm not talking about the fireside chats. Before the fireside chats, before he became president, he understood radio's power and impact. And he used it at the Democratic conventions of 1924 and 1928. When he gave speeches, he didn't give it to the hall in front of him, the people arrayed before him. He recognized that he was speaking to a broader audience, that he was speaking to the nation when he was giving his speeches. And no other politician at the time recognized that. And so Roosevelt really mastered radio even before. And um, he, he, he kind of came back at him when, after he won the nomination in, in 1932, he called his mother to tell her that he had won the, the nomination, and she said, oh, I know already. I heard it on the radio. Now, I did mention the fireside chats, and he did take them very seriously. He had a special paper that wouldn't rustle, so you wouldn't hear him flipping pages when he was speaking, so that people would think he was speaking off the cuff. He had a slight whistle from a gap in his teeth, and he would put a false tooth in to prevent that whistle from taking place. And he carefully marshaled the fireside chats. I mean, we think about it in, uh, in historical lore. He must have been giving fireside chats all the time. He only gave two or three a year. And he, in fact, thought he was wary of being overexposed. And he thought that Churchill, a great communicator, nevertheless, he thought that Churchill spoke too often on the radio and, and, and diminished his effectiveness by going too often on the radio. And, of course, 
Churchill's country was about to be invaded in a way that the U.S. was not quite as threatened with. So may maybe I can forgive him for going on the radio so much. But, but Roosevelt was wary of going on the radio too often and, and took this new medium seriously. Now, the next innovation in this, the fourth era I want to talk about is the television era. In the television era, you had this development. Not only could you send your voice over the, the airwaves, but you could send your image, and you could appear in people's living rooms. And uh, Daniel Borston, who's one of, one of my favorite writers and favorite historians, talks about this notion about how people can be there, meaning at the Democratic convention or a political convention, and then at the same time be here in your living room, and how that changed the whole equation. And in fact, Bill Clinton watched in 1956 the Democratic convention, and he saw Adlai Stevenson's acceptance speech. Now, this was the second time Adlai Stevenson had accepted the nomination. He lost in 1952. He would go on to lose in 1956. And Stevenson, who was a very good speaker, came on and accepted the nomination with great reluctance and modesty. And Bill Clinton said in his memoirs, I couldn't imagine why someone would be reluctant to take on the mantle of running for president and, and being president. But at a very young age, this presidential candidate, Adlai Stevenson, was influencing Bill Clinton. Now, of course, Stevenson lost both times to Eisenhower. And I argue in the book that Eisenhower was a television revolutionary that he doesn't often get credit for. And he was in a number of ways. He was the first president to give a televised press conference. He was the first president to hire an outside media advisor who had worked in the television industry. He also uh, was very effective at his on-air television addresses. If you think about the, uh, the most famous phrase of the Eisenhower presidency, it's the uh, military industrial complex, which he gave in his farewell address in a phrase that is still with us today. He also understood and appreciated the entertainment aspects of television. And Many of us may remember him, he and Mamie sitting and watching TV, uh, watching TV while eating TV dinners. He would watch I Love Lucy. He loved to watch westerns of all sorts. He watched them on TV. He watched them in the movies. In fact, he watched movies, western movies so often that the White House ushers complained that they had trouble finding westerns that he hadn't seen. And the White House uh, uh, ushers also complained that sometimes the television schedule set the social schedule in the Eisenhower White House. And before we think of Ike as some poor lowbrow, it makes sense to some degree, because in this era, there was no DVR. You didn't have Netflix. You didn't have a VCR. If you missed that episode of I Love Lucy, you were out of luck. And these shows were watched by millions and many millions, many more than are watched by even the, the best known shows today. And Ike helped show himself to be the part of the common man, a, a common man by watching TV like everybody else. So he understood that. But there was something else going on. Because when you are president, you don't just watch TV, as I say in the book, you are TV. Because you can appear in people's living rooms, like I said in the, uh, the Stevenson and, and Bill Clinton story. And you can do so in a way that shapes people's perceptions, but shapes the product that goes out on the TV. And I tell this story in the book, um, fast forwarding a couple of presidencies to the Bill Clinton administration when Clinton was having his troubles with the Lewinsky scandal. At one point, he goes away on vacation to get away from it. He goes with Hillary and he goes with Terry McAuliffe, who's now running for governor in Virginia, but he's been a longtime friend and fundraiser of the Clintons. And at this getaway, they're trying to watch TV and Hillary has the remote and she's trying to find a channel that does not have the scandal mentioned. And she's clicking, 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 trying to find a channel, trying, and she can't find one. She's getting more and more frustrated. Finally, she finds one channel that doesn't have it on, and it's ESPN. Not at all her favorite channel, but for that night, it was acceptable. And I tell at that, a story of at that same retreat, at that same vacation, the White House ushers come over to ask at one point if anybody would like some wine, and Hillary says no, and Bill says no, and McAuliffe understandably says, I'll take the bottle, please. <laughs> as it must have been a very awkward vacation. But this is what has happened in the television era, that presidents can watch TV and appreciate TV, and, and many of our presidents have. Um, uh, Ronald Reagan used to watch Murder, She Wrote, and he loved watching the Sunday shows. Our current, TV, our current president, um, Barack Obama, likes to watch uh, kind of edgy, gritty shows that are on pay cable. I joke that he likes the shows of the 1% rather than those of the 99%. He likes The Wire, or he liked The Wire. He likes Mad Men. 
He likes, um, uh, he does not like Broken Bad as far as I know, but he does like Homeland. Somebody said Ho Homeland over there. In fact, at one point, he was briefed on a, a possible uh, terrorist sleeper cell in the U.S., and he said, just like Homeland. <laughs> so it, it's clearly on his mind. And, and Jonathan Alter writes in his recent book, didn't make my book, but that, that he would go into, uh, he'd, he'd sometimes go into his office, close the door, pretend to work, and actually watch episodes of Homeland. So he he does he, um, he watches TV, but he, he's clearly not the only one. TV is just a part of our lives. It's become a part of the American establishment, and it's one of the things that um, that 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 binds us together uh, for good or for ill. Now, the fifth era I talk about is the current era, the internet era, and we don't have that much evidence or history of this era yet because it's really a very recent development and I think there's more story to be told here. But President Obama, I argue in the book, was masterful at understanding this era because what he has done is he recognizes the segmentation of the audience. Back when JR was shot and everyone was wondering who shot JR, that show had 100 million viewers. Uh, when the last episode of MASH was on, that had 106 million viewers. Breaking Bad, the finale's on tonight. I don't know what, how many people are going to watch it tonight, but last week, Susan got it correctly, it was about 6 million people watched it. Seems like everybody's talking about it on Twitter, but not that many people watch even the most prominent shows. So we have a very segmented society, and President Obama recognized that and used it, and it would reach out to different audiences uh, based on who he needed in the in, in the electorate. And he was very skillful at getting the youth vote, for example. He went on the Jimmy Fallon show and, and slow jammed the news and was called the preezy of the United Steezy, whatever that means. Uh, he, I mentioned earlier, he went on The View many times to get the, the important uh, women's vote. And so he recognizes that you can't just reach out to people in one specific place. You've got to find them in the place where they are. And thanks to segmentation and social science data, you can figure out who the people you're trying to reach are who are likely to vote for you and are likely to support you. And in fact, the, uh, the title of the book has that phrase, and Obama tweeted, President Obama has a Twitter account with over 30 million followers. Not every tweet comes from him, but the ones that do come from him have the letters B-O at the end. And so you know that is directly from him. So those are the five errors I talk about in the book, and I just want to talk briefly about why does this matter? What's important about it, and why is it relevant? And I found a couple of things. Number one, there's an economic aspect to it. You've, we've all heard that uh, at certain times when, uh, when President Obama uh, watched uh, or read, for example, um, uh, Freedom by Jonathan Franzen a few years ago, that book became a mega bestseller. Uh, it wasn't exclusively because of President Obama. Was, you know, Franzen had a, a good track record. But the book really caught a wave because President Obama went to the Bunches of Grapes bookstore in, in Martha's Vineyard before the book was available, was given a copy by the uh, proprietor, and that made it into the newspapers, and everybody wanted to get a copy of the, the book at that point. And in fact, the Sunday Times after the Labor Day that year had in three different sections mentions of the fact that President Obama had gotten a copy of Fra Franzen's Freedom, which is priceless publicity. So there's an economic aspect, and it's been going on for a while. When Ronald Reagan read The Hunt for Red October and, and touted it, it elevated Tom Clancy for an, uh, an obscure insurance salesman to a mega best-selling author. And similarly, John F. Kennedy touted some of the James Bond novels and helped make those big bestsellers. So there's an economic aspect. There is sometimes a policy aspect, usually, not always, but usually with books. So I, t I tell the story of Kennedy and the, um, the, the book Michael Harrington's Other America. Kennedy was given a book review of that book by his, his staff. And this book was about poverty in America and the intractable problems of, of, of poverty in Appalachia. And he was inspired and, and said, let's come up with a program to address this. And thus the, um, the war on poverty was born. It was, uh, it was carried out by Lyndon Johnson, but the, the policy ideas came out after that, that conversation with Kennedy. And so, so in addition to the, the policy and the economic aspect, the third aspect is presidents use culture to convey aspects of leadership. And what do I mean by this? Presidents can use the different modes of culture to show something about who they are in a way that is advantageous to them and their political perspective. So, for example, I've talked about presidential reading. Presidents use books to show their intellectual side. Bill Clinton was a master at this. In fact, he had the, uh, the corner of the desk trick where he would put a book on the corner of his desk and reporters would come in and they'd note, oh, you're reading Stephen Carter's Culture of Disbelief. That gave Stephen Carter a nice plug in, in the media and made Stephen Carter 
predisposed to like Clinton, but it also gave the sense that here's a guy who's reading serious books. And Clinton did read serious books. He wasn't faking, but he also liked mysteries. He read th three to four mysteries a week, and he didn't put those on the side of the desk. I mean, he was conveying an aspect of leadership that was advantageous to him. It wouldn't have done so to have, a, let's say, a Walter Mosley novel, although he did like Mosley. It was more uh, advantageous to him to have works of serious nonfiction. So that, that's one piece of it. Second is they can try and show their um, larger-than-life aspects um, through, uh, through movies. And so uh, Ronald Reagan was a master at this. He would uh, refer to movies often. Obviously, he wouldn't have even been president or even, even been famous had it not been for Hollywood and, and the movies. And he understood what movies represented to the American people. In, in fact, uh, one of Reagan's favorite movies and one of the favorite movies of presidents in general has been High Noon which is the Gary Cooper movie where Gary Cooper stands alone in a tough situation when everybody else has deserted him, but he stands strong. Bill Clinton watched that movie 20 times. And so it conveys an aspect of, of larger than life, great leadership, uh, willing to take tough and make tough decisions. And then another aspect of it is trying to be the common man. This is the idea I talked about earlier. How do you show you're a regular guy? Well, you watch TV just like everybody else. You know, Americans don't necessarily want to hire a couch potato. They don't want somebody who's watching TV all the time. But if you watch The Wire or Homeland or uh, Murder, She Wrote or whatever shows presidents have watched, people who watch that show say, hey, yeah, the president watches that show just like I do. And so we have today so many options for presidents, so many modes of culture. I, uh, some of the reviews of the book have suggested that I show a predisposition or a favoritism towards reading, and I won't deny that. Uh, I, I think reading is the, probably the best thing presidents can do in their leisure time. But I think if you only read, you show yourself to be narrower than you need to be to be elected in the current environment, and that presidents who understand culture and understand our culture and understand American culture I believe, will do better than presidents who don't. Thank you very much for coming. But music is used to convey hipness. And I, I have a whole pre chapter on presidents and music. And it's amazing how in the 1950s, things that were completely subversive by the 1970s were regular, and by the 1990s were accepted in the White House. So Elvis, for example, in the 1950s, couldn't show the gyration of his hips on the Ed Sullivan show. But in the 1970s, I tell the story of how Elvis came to visit Richard Nixon in the White House. That picture of Nixon and Elvis is the most famous and most requested picture by the national, from the National Archives still today. And in, it was a bizarre meeting. Nick, uh, Elvis wanted to get some kind of law, uh, ex officio law enforcement, drug enforcement officer badge. He thought it might help him <laughs> smuggle drugs, actually. Um, and Nixon thought it might make him look like a more human person, I guess, <laughs> by meeting with, with Elvis. And they met, and they were at cross purposes the whole time. They didn't really get each other, and they, they didn't understand what the other was saying. But there was one priceless moment in the meeting when Nixon looked at Elvis and said, you dress kind of strange, don't you? And Elvis said to him, you have your show, and I have mine. And Elvis, Elvis was clearly right. But the, uh, and, and people who saw Nixon on the beach and his wingtips would recognize that Nixon dressed kind of strange himself too sometimes. But I talk about, uh, again, uh, uh, Bill Clinton in some ways is a, is a hero of the book because he understood that America was ready to accept rock and roll in the 90s when in the 50s it was, it was not at all acceptable. In the 70s it was perhaps marginal. But he, had, he was very skillful with um, that song, Don't Stop Thinking About Tomorrow, the Fleetwood Mac song in the, um, in the 92 campaign. In fact, the, um, the, the band, which had broken up, came together to play the song, even though they hate each other, they came together to play the song at the, the Clinton inaugural. And we mentioned Elvis. Clinton, when he went on the Arsenio Hall show, put on sunglasses and played the saxophone, the song he played was uh, Elvis's Heartbreak Hotel. Not very well, according to the critics at the time, but that is, that is the song he played. So, so Clinton understood that America was ready to have a president who embraced and, and uh, understood rock music. In fact, uh, the, the New York Times called him our first rock and roll president. So yeah, music is a very important part of the, the story. But it really, I found, is much more of a, an, an important part of the story, story in the 20th century. Once you had the development of radio and songs that could go 
nationwide rather than than more regional forms of music. And uh, I tell the story of Ulysses S. Grant at one point is asked what kind of music he likes. And he said, I only know two songs. One of them is Yankee Doodle and the other isn't. Hi, it sounds like an interesting book. Is this on? Okay. Uh, obviously, I'm someone who likes books, and I still Twitter by fountain pen. And I'm <laughs> not sure I'm encouraged by what I'm hearing. Uh, do you think presidents are perforce going to have to become more and more uh, entertainers as time goes on? It's a very good question, and it's one that I do address in, in the book. Uh, I think presidents have to recognize the showmanship aspects of the, the job. In fact, there, there's one story where Ronald Reagan is with Nancy Reagan, and he's supposed to record a spot, and Nancy is kind of backseat driving him and second-guessing him and telling him, do it this way, do it that way. And at one point, Reagan looks at Nancy and says, you know, Nancy, I have done this before. So the, the showmanship aspect is important, but I think that it's more important to getting elected than it is to good governing. And I wonder if President Obama's use of the culture and perhaps overexposure in, in some of the more um, lowbrow forms of, of media can be damaging A to him, but B to the presidency. And when I say to him, I think about, for example, the, uh, the Syria speech a few years ago. I mean, he appears on Jay Leno and Letterman and, uh, and late night talk shows, first president as president to appear on the late night comedy shows. And he shows up on The View a bunch of times and you wonder if he's overexposed and then he tries to give a speech, a serious speech on Syria about a very serious issue, and it seems like the American people, for a variety of reasons, but this may be one of them, are, are not paying attention. And then I wonder about the long-term implications for the presidency. Does it reduce the stature of the presidency to have a president going out there on these kind of popular entertainment shows? And, and I know a lot of the White House press corps grumbled in the last election that Obama would appear on a New Mexico DJ and answer questions about whether he liked green chili or red chili, but he wouldn't go on Meet the Press, for example, and so that frustrated the, the Washington press corps. But that's yeah, a good question. I mean, is this like, will Obama's Twitter feed or will a future candidate candidate's Twitter feed matter in a significant way or is it really more, I mean, I, don't, I know there's no real scientific answer to this, but like, how significant is this and how much will this be how much of this is deliberately manipulated for electoral purposes? Yeah, it's a good question. First of all, a lot of it is manipulated for electoral purposes because I talk about this, this notion of the filtration effect, that we know that Obama watched certain shows or Clinton read certain books or Bush read certain books because we are told that he read them and they choose to tell us some things and they don't tell us others. So that that's one thing that's always going on and you have to be aware of. And so... I would never say that my book is a definitive view of what every president watched or read because you know, there are some things they want to keep private and there, there's no way you, you can know. And then it's also possible that some presidents have claimed to read books that they didn't actually read. So th that, that is always something that, that is in the background kind of lurking whenever you have this conversation. But in terms of the political impact, I think my point is that whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, you have to understand culture. But there are different strategies for doing so, whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, based on which, which party you're from. And in fact, I have an appendix in the book where I have rules for engaging with pop culture for presidents, and they vary a little bit whether you're a Democratic or a Republican. But on, on the Mitt Romney thing, I, it is interesting that he was not opposed or uninterested or unaware of pop culture. And I talk about how he did make pop culture references, but the references he made were to Seinfeld and Ferris Bueller. <laughs> and I like both. I mean, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're perfectly legitimate references. But if you think about them, both, both of them are multiple decades old. I mean, they, you know, there's even a Twitter feed now called Modern Seinfeld, which I don't know if any of you follow Twitter, but it's hysterical. It, is, it makes up Seinfeld plots based on technologies that didn't exist when... Seinfeld was on the air. And it wasn't that long ago that Seinfeld was on the air. So, you know, it has Jerry and, and Kramer getting involved in a Twitter war or, or Facebook spam or stuff that really is so new that, um, that it didn't exist then, but um, is now such an accepted part of our culture. So uh, Romney, I think, was a little dated in his references, and, and I think that hurt him. 
But I don't think that the next president, be they a Democrat or or Republican, need to be as culturally savvy as President Obama. In fact, I, in, I have in my uh, in my chapter on him, I just talk about how much TV he watched as a youth, and it's kind of staggering that uh, that someone got into the schools he did, given how much TV he watched uh, as a kid. And, and these days, it's so much harder to get into those schools that may, maybe uh, I don't know if kids could be as successful as he has been by watching that much TV. In fact, I, I tell the story in the book that um, Harry Truman was our, the last president not to have graduated college. George H.W. Bush was the last president without a graduate degree. And Ronald Reagan was the last president not to have gone to Harvard or Yale. And so, in some cases, both, like George W. Bush went to both. So we have a situation where it's such a minuscule population that even gets to run for president that you, you wonder if they can be that up to date on pop culture and, and still accomplish the things they, they have to accomplish. But good questions. Thank you. Um, you made the point earlier, and I thought it was a good point that uh, we don't want to elect the couch potato. We don't want to elect someone who watches too much TV. But taking it to a normative level, like what? I guess it's a, maybe somewhat of a personal question, and I'm getting directed toward reading. What do you think presidents should be reading? Like, what if your ideal presidential candidate? Like, what types of things do you think presidents should be reading? And what do we as Americans think they should be reading? Like, of course, we want a president. Like, we're a Christian nation. We want. We like to think the president reads the Bible. Like what other things like that do you think the president should be reading? Yeah, uh, Teddy Roosevelt has actually asked this question about what people should read, and he said he was he was unwilling to uh, bring it down to a list because he he despised these lists. And then he went on for pages and pages about things that people should read, and he talked about the Bible, and he talked about history, and he talked about biography, and he just went on and on about all these things that you know only Teddy Roosevelt possibly could read this stuff. He would read, I say, in the book that he read sometimes two to three books a night yeah. while president. So. Uh, it, it's hard to say what books necessarily make you a better person, but I would say from a political perspective and from my observations in, in writing this book, presidents are well served by reading serious nonfiction, especially history and biography. And that when presidents try and deviate too much from that, that's often when they get into trouble. So uh, when when George W. Bush read Camus the Stranger, he was just vilified and mocked for, for reasons. They, they didn't believe that he actually read a French as existentialist. Um, Obama's gotten a little guff for reading some of these kind of very highbrow, complicated novels, and how is that helping him become president? And, um, and Franzen even said something along those lines, you know, shouldn't he be doing something better than, than reading my book? So th th there's that aspect to it. Uh, but it, it seems to me that politically, you really can't go wrong reading history and biography, and intellectually, it's not a bad thing.